All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Juan, as it says on the patch. Um, here I'm with my friend, uh, Ari. Um, we work for a um, software consulting company in Argentina. And today we're going to talk about Crystal. Crystal is, um, is a programming language that we've been working on. And uh, it's a Ruby-like language, but um, it is uh, uh, statically typed and <coughs> compiled and more efficient than Ruby. And so let's see. So I want to start um, showing some uh, demonstration so you can figure out uh, what kind of applications you can run in Crystal. So let's start with a very simple example. It's a Mandelbrot set generator. Uh, so I can compile the example uh, running Crystal build uh, samples Mandelbrot here. So this creates an executable that I can run. So there we go. So okay. maybe the resolution is. Uh, so um, we can see how much time it takes to render this. It's just uh, seven milliseconds. I can run, for this example, I can also run it uh, directly using uh, Ruby because the, the syntax is pretty simple, uh, pretty similar, I mean. Um, so if I run the same program with, with Ruby, we get the same result. But it takes around mm, mm, more than 100 milliseconds, so we get a, a big uh, optimization there. So um, another example, um, it's a ray tracer. Ray tracer is a, um, a way of uh, rendering 3D images, 3D scenes into images. Um, so this time I'm going to um, compile the with a um, release mode, which uh, adds some uh, compile time optimizations. And I can run now, and then we get uh, this this result. This is this is not an image loaded from this. This is rendered on, on real time, and uh, we see we got uh, around uh, less than 200 milliseconds, which is not bad at all. Um, let's see another example. This is uh, should be much more fun. This is a Nintendo emulator written on 100% Crystal uh, code, so I can uh, run, I can load the. Uh, the image, and we get a. Uh, this is uh, uh, being emulated by the all all running in, in Crystal. I know that a big, uh, I know that good uh, <laughs> Mario player, but uh. <laughs> so um, let's get serious. <clears throat> so um, let me explain why we did this. Um, so I said before. Um, we work for a software consulting company, so we build software for our customers. And we often use Ruby as our primary tool, and the, the reason for this is uh, Ruby uh, fits really well into agile methodologies. It allows us to uh, take a project from theory to practice in, in, uh, very quickly and maintain elegant and maintainable code. But Sometimes we get um, some performance problems. Sometimes we have to, after some time, we need to migrate some of the backend to other languages because uh, uh, of performance issues. And so we uh, normally migrate to some compiler language because uh, compiler language tend to be faster, at least. Um, also, uh, Ruby is a dynamic language, and sometimes there are some kind of errors that if not catched by unit tests, unfortunately they uh, are triggered at runtime. So uh, static type checking allow us to, um, it contributes to uh, catching some of those errors at compile time. And we wanted the best of each world, so we started this project to uh, experiment with a language that can provide the flexibility of Ruby, but the advantages of a compiler and um, type of language. So um, we inherited the syntax from Ruby. Uh, this simple code here is either a Ruby or a Crystal uh, um, program. Not every Ruby program is a Crystal program, and not every Crystal program is a Ruby program. 
as we'll see in a moment, but uh, we inherit many of the things we like from Ruby. It's a statically type check, as I said, so we can get compile time errors about missing overloads or um, things like that. <clears throat> it generates a very efficient uh, uh, mm, binary executable. Uh, we make a special emphasis on this on every aspect of the language. <clears throat> so I'm not a very big fan of uh, benchmarks, uh, but I think uh, we can, uh, I can show some of the results, so you can figure out uh, where Crystal is positioned uh, compared to other languages. So, the first example is uh, um, BrainFag is um, interpreted of, uh, basically it's a, a Turing machine. Um, as you can see, uh, Crystal gets results very similar to the C++ implementation. Compared to the Ruby one, which is a very similar code base uh, that takes uh, like a uh, uh, hundred times slower. The second example is uh, matrix multiplication, and here we get even more close results to the C implementation, and Ruby is just a uh, hundred times slower. And the last example is uh, Hublag, is um, a benchmark set created by Google. Some, a member of our community migrated, this, uh, ported this benchmark to Crystal, and we got a surprising result because we uh, got even better results on the C++ implementation. And this time we compare with Python uh, because uh, there were no results for Ruby, probably st still running. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> this is a snapshot of a few days ago from GitHub of uh, the Crystal source code. And Something I want to no note here, um, we have a, a, a growing community and a lot of people that is putting stars on, on our project. And uh, for those who don't know what this means, this is like a, a Facebook, Facebook like, right? <laughs> and uh, also notice that um, Crystal is written on Crystal itself, so uh, it's complete bootstrap by now. Uh, we've been working for this, with this project for three years now. Uh, at the beginning, of course, the first implementation was not written in Crystal. The first one was written on Ruby. But once we got uh, a stable implementation, we migrated all the code from Ruby to Crystal. And now we have a complete uh, self-hosted. So now Ari is going to give a brief introduction of the elements of the language so you can uh, uh, get an idea of how to use it. So, hi everyone, I'm Ari. So, I'll give you a brief overview of the language. Of course, in 40 minutes we can say everything, but so let's begin. So, let's start with the data types. Uh, Crystal is an object oriented language, so everything's an object. And then we have two big categories we have a value, which are value types, uh, they are allocated on the stack and are passed by value. And here we have uh, booleans, characters, we also have the numbers. Their representation is pretty efficient, just uh, in 32 is just four bytes. And then uh, we also can define custom user types, uh, value types, which are structs. So in this way we can create um, lightweight wrappers around uh, other primitive types so we can avoid allocating memory in most of the cases. And then the second uh, big category is reference which are objects that are allocated on the heap and are passed by reference. And they are managed by a garbage collector, so to free the memory for us, so we don't have to take care of uh, memory management. And most of the object, uh, objects fall in this category, right? But then Crystal introduces, uh, has a, another concept, which is a union types. And that happens when a variable has um, more than one type across uh, different points in the program. So for example, here we have uh, an array of mixed types, uh, numbers and strings. And when we access one of those elements, what we get back is a union type, which is, uh, again, a number of string. Later we will see how to deal with uh, these unions. Uh, another example is when we have, uh, when we want to ask for the uh, position of a character in a, in a string. So the character might be there, and we, we return a, a number, 
that, that's the position. But if it's not there, uh, we return nil, and that will mean that, that the character is absent, and again, we have a union type. So these unions are uh, represented uh, in memory pretty efficiently. So here we have a union of a Boolean and a number, and they are represented with a, with a compact struct that has a type ID, and then enough storage for all of the values that uh, conform the union. But for some unions, we have a more efficient representation, so uh, if you have a reference type and nil. Uh, so in our language, in other languages, in some other languages, references can be nil, and this is not distinguished, but in crystal they are different things. So string and nil are different things. And we represent this as a single pointer. If it's the null pointer, then it will be nil. And if not, uh, it will be a pointer pointing to the data. So again, it's uh, pretty efficient. Then just like in Ruby, uh, methods can uh, accept uh, blocks. So on the left-hand side, we have um, a method declaration. On the right-hand side, we have uh, some code invoking it. And with the yield keyword on the left, uh, what happens is that uh, we execute the, the block that's passed on the right. And the right code looks really nice and uh, really expressive. Um, and the important thing here is that uh, Crystal will always inline these kind of blocks. So uh, if you write while um, or write it li like this with a block, the generated code will be the same. The, there's no performance penalty at all. So you can get to be expressive, but uh, you don't sacri sacrifice performance. Then we also have uh, procs, which are typed anonymous uh, functions. So here we have a, a proc that uh, receives an integer and returns an integer. In this case, you have to put the types. Um, and these procs can also form closures, which means that uh, they can refer to variables declare, uh, declared outside of the, the, the proc's body. So here we are accessing the y variable, and then we change it. and when we invoke it, invoke it uh, the results uh, change. Then we, we made a choice here uh, that's a bit different from Ruby. Uh, in Ruby, if you want to, to have a method uh, behave differently according to the number of arguments or, uh, or their types, you can do this, but the way to do, is, uh, to do it is um, by performing runtime checks. So you ask the, the number of uh, arguments or the types, and the code uh, becomes larger and harder to understand and to, to read. But it's also slower, because these checks are done every time you invoke the method. And in Crystal, you have uh, method overloads. So you can overload based on RIT or the, the, the types. And when you invoke these methods, uh, the compiler will infer the types of the arguments and find the, the matches. So if the, there's just one match at compile time, that uh, call will be hard-coded to that. So there's no uh, runtime check to, to be done. And if the, the argument types are unions and there are many matches, this, uh, this decision to which overload to call uh, will be delayed to runtime. Uh, this is usually called uh, multiple dispatch. Um, and it's pretty powerful. Then we, of course, based our language on Ruby. And in Ruby, you don't, uh, you don't have type annotations because it's a dynamic language. And we wanted to preserve that uh, as much as possible. So we have a global, global type inference uh, algorithm. That means uh, types are inferred across the, the whole program. And for that to happen, we have to infer the types uh, of each expression in our program. So I'll gr give a brief overview of this. Uh, there are some more uh, complex details, but this is the basic idea. So let's start with the simple stuff, uh, literals. The compiler, well, the language knows what uh, their type is. So nil is nil, uh, false and true are booleans. And you have the numbers, characters, and strings. Then moving on to assignments. Here what happens is that uh, the variable a will be bound to the type of uh, the expression on the right-hand side. So then we have another assignment. And later we, can see, we will see that uh, the type of the, the, the nodes in, the, in our program can change over time, right, when we, when we compile the program. And th these types are transferred uh, across the nodes. 
So there's a really a binding between the nodes and types uh, travel and change. Then we, if we assign to a variable in multiple uh, execution branches, uh, different execution branches, at the end of uh, the, this if, what will happen is, is that A will get uh, to be a union type, right? Because in the, in the first case we assign an integer and then a string. Now uh, let's deal with uh, methods and calls. So in Ruby uh, and in Crystal too, you don't uh, need to specify the types of the arguments. So in a way, every method is like a C++ template, if you know them. Uh, and only when you invoke them, the compiler will type it. So what will happen is, is that first the compiler will uh, infer the, the type of the arguments. So here we have two integers. And the compiler will instantiate uh, the, uh, an instance of this method with those types and then it will proceed to type uh, the body. And in this case, it will be an integer, the, the result. But if we invoke this method with uh, two strings, again, an another instance uh, of the, the, this method will be generated, but with, uh, but with uh, two strings as the arguments, and then when we infer the body, we will get a string. Yes? We don't have a separate compilation. It's l like in Ruby, you run the program, everything is interpreted. In our case, um, we have to compile everything from scratch, but it's pretty fast. Like the compiler has around 30,000 lines of code. That's excluding the standard library. And it's about eight to 15 seconds to compile. Mo most of the time is taken by the code generation. The type inference is about uh, three, four seconds. But um, we, don't discuss, we, dis we don't discard this idea of separate completion. We have to think about it because it's, uh, these ideas are pretty, uh, I don't know, maybe novel and there's not a, a known solution for this, so we have to work it out. Uh, continuing with the uh, methods and calls, uh, this of course has to work with uh, recursive definitions because otherwise the language uh, is not very useful. So let's see a, a bit uh, more complex example with a factorial. So again, we invoke it with a string. So an instance is generated with a string argument. And then we have an if. An if is an expression in Crystal, so it will get the value of the branch that's executed. And so uh, its type will be uh, the, the type union of the branches. So it will be, the type will be a union. And then we have the two branches. On one case, we have a multiplication, and on the other side, we have a literal. But let's start from the top, so it's uh, the left, so it's a multiplication. And here we have a factorial of an integer, and this we can uh, deduce because n is an integer, and minus one is an integer. So here we need the type of fact uh, instantiated with an integer, which is exactly the same thing that we are trying to solve so uh, we, we don't have a result for this. But we, what we can do is say, okay, this type will be the type of, uh, the type of this call will be the type of the, this method uh, insta instantiated with integer, so we bind it. And we can continue here, so we, can, we continue with the integer literal. And that's easy to type, it, it's an integer. So the union, at least has some information that's an, an integer and something still unknown, but the compiler say, okay, I have an integer, let's uh, move it forward to fact uh, in 32, and now we get a type, a partial type, that's an integer. Now that we know that, the type is propagated to the uh, node at the bottom, so now we know that's an integer, and we can perform the multiplication. And when we multiply two integers, we get an integer, and then we have the union of integer and integer, and that's just integer. So, uh, and that integer is again propagated up, and we are done because we don't have more types changes like we, we reached a fixed point. So that's the basic idea of how it works. And there we go. So now let's consider this example. We have a string, and as uh, I said before, we ask for the position of a character, so index ask for the position of a character in the string. And we set this uh, because of the, how the method is implemented, uh, returns an integer or nil. Uh, 
Now, usually in, in a dynamic language where all things happen in runtime, if we try to index this string with a, and the, the character was not there, we will get a runtime saying, no, we, you can't index a, a string with, a, with nil. Um, in this case, the compiler will complain, so you won't be able to, to actually create a program out of this uh, because there's, there's no overload for this uh, string uh, accessor uh, accessing a, a position with nil. So the compiler prevented us uh, from making a mistake. And this also applies, for example, when you have a, a union type and you try to invoke a method on it. All the, all the methods need to be in, the, in, in every type. So you don't get, uh, we don't have null pointer exceptions, so basically, or invoking, you don't get undefined method at runtime. But we can solve this problem by using a check. So if we do if IDX, for those of you who uh, know Ruby or, or not, um, the only values that can fail an if condition, so give, uh, go to the else branch, are nil and, f and false. So in the then branch of the if, uh, <coughs> if the condition passed, IDX can't be nil, and the compiler automatically downcasts uh, IDX to be an integer. So uh, it's pretty expressive, and now we can perform this operation. And another way to do it is with an is a. So this is an operator. It looks like a method, but it's uh, part of the language. We can ask if IDX is an integer. Then inside the then branch of the if, uh, the compiler again will downcast uh, the, the variable. So we don't need a separate variable or something like that. So it's uh, pretty comfortable, comfortable to program with that. Yes? No, in this case, it's uh, the first representation of a union. So you will have a small struct with a type ID. And then if it's nil, the, the value doesn't matter because nil is always nil. And if it's an integer, it's an integer. So it, it will be eight bytes, for example, for the type ID and the integer. So we, we always try to take uh, really good uh, care for the performance. Uh, we don't do our auto boxing or stuff like that. We, we try to be pretty efficient. Um, then we have uh, types and uh, click classes, and they can have instance variables, like in many other object-oriented languages. And the thing is here that uh, the type of the instance variables will be inferred uh, from the values assigned to them across the, the whole program. So here we instantiate a person with a name, and it's a string, so the compiler will type this uh, name as a, a string. But if later in our program we create a person with an integer, uh, the name instance variable will get uh, the type, uh, a union type of integer and string. And this doesn't work well with the uh, data types. So if you have arrays or um, uh, other collections, you don't want, uh, you, w you want separate types for each uh, collection. So we have the notion of generic types. So here we have a generic stack class with a T parameter. And we can create a stack that will only contain integers and another stack that will only contain strings. Uh, so yeah. And now I'll leave you again with uh, Juan, who will talk a bit uh, more about concurrency and some other features. OK, so um, as we are doing uh, language that could perform well, we also wanted it to handle concurrency uh, a little bit better than Ruby does. So uh, we, for, for this topic, we inspired on, on other languages like Go and Erlang. These two languages have in common that uh, they release the programmer uh, to th in thinking about operating system threads and mutexes and blocks and, and stuff like that. So in, in Crystal, we have this notion of lightweight processes. So you can use the spawn function that receives a block. And it, what it does is will create one of these lightweight processes that we call fibers. And these fibers are uh, managed by the uh, language runtime, so automatically. Um, so when you uh, invoke spawn, it will create the, the fiber, 
and the program continues running. And uh, the language runtime will decide when to schedule in that fiber in and out. We do uh, always uh, blocking uh, I.O. So every time you invoke, uh, um, for example, uh, sending or receiving packets uh, from the network, uh, it will block the execution of that fiber. So at that moment, the language runtime will schedule out that fiber and schedule in another fiber that is on, on uh, that is waiting to be run. And when the data comes in, for example, through the network, the language runtime will schedule back in that fiber. So you don't have to deal with uh, callbacks like in Node.js or, or or things like that. You just write linear code, and the language runtime will uh, figure out how to schedule the the fibers. We also um, uh, use this notion of uh, channels from from Go uh, that you can use to communicate and synchronize uh, fibers. So in this example, we create a channel that sends and receives integers, and the fiber will be uh, awaiting for a, a message to come through the channel. So this is also another point where the uh, language runtime will schedule out the fiber if the channel doesn't have messages waiting to be received. So uh, the fiber will be scheduled out until another fiber sends a message through the channel. And this is a um, pretty simple concept that we can use to communicate fibers uh, each other. It's actually inherited from another uh, concept, which is uh, CSP, communication sequential processes. So um, let's talk about now about metaprogramming. Uh, Ruby is a, a very dynamic language. You can uh, modify the program as it runs because uh, the code and the data of your program lives on the same memory space. So you can change the program uh, at runtime. But in Crystal, we cannot do that, or it would be really expensive, and we don't want that. So we need to add another way of uh, dealing with metaprogramming. So for example, um, here we have a, a class and we declare two uh, accessors of uh, instance variables. And we see there is some uh, uh, duplicated code here because we declare uh, a method with a name and we access the instance variable with the same name. So in Ruby, you can use some uh, special methods that come with the language that will declare do, declare those methods uh, for us. In Crystal, we introduced the concept of macros that will execute at compile time and generate the code that, that for, for us. So we can declare the getter macro, for example, and this is a, the, the simplest example of a macro that I can show, but uh, it receives the, the name of the, the accessor that we want to generate, and you, you use those uh, double bracket placeholders to replace with the uh, nodes that we receive as arguments. So now we can rewrite our person class using this macro like this. We can also go even further and create a macro that receives uh, many arguments and we can uh, iterate through those arguments and generate uh, as many accessors as we want. So. Um, the macro is the, the macro system is quite powerful, and uh, we can use it to generate uh, uh, and avoid a lot of boilerplate at compile time. We can even execute external uh, processes that generate uh, code in, in in Crystal. And finally, um, as I said at the beginning, Crystal is uh, completed boot, bootstrapped right now. I mean, it's self-hosted. Everything is written on Crystal. So if we want to communicate with the external world, I mean the native libraries uh, of the operating system or the standard C library or things like that, we needed to add some uh, some way of declaring those external external libraries. So for example, we can use the we use the live uh, block. So um, to declare external external functions. Of course, you have to annotate the type of all those functions, and then you can just invoke those functions directly in, the, in your Crystal code. We can also declare C structures and allocate them and pass pointers to the external functions. 
We can also use uh, procs uh, as function pointers to give callbacks to other to other libraries. And the important thing is that this, all this happens inside Crystal without having to go to any other language to create extensions of the language. So uh, about the future, um, right now all the concurrency that I just mentioned a moment ago happens on a on a single thread. Uh, is it still really uh, efficient? For ex um, for example, on, on my machine, on this laptop, I can run a HTTP server that uh, um, responds about uh, 60,000 requests per second. But uh, we still want to add multi-thread support so, to, uh, so we can take advantage of all the cores of the computer. Uh, debugger, we have only a very simple debugger, but uh, we are working on that. Frameworks and libraries, I mean, no, yes. Oh. But, but it's 30 minutes or 40 minutes right it now? Was 30, this is like uh, 35 minutes of work. Uh, okay. okay. Okay, well, still we're going to be hanging around so we, you can uh, come by to ask questions. Yeah, so I think I'll have some time for questions. Yes. We use, um, yes. Okay. okay, yeah, so the question was uh, what we use for GZ, right? So we use the, right now we use the uh, Bohem GC, GC, which is an open source uh, GC that is pluggable on, on uh, native uh, applications. We plan to replace it with something else in the future, but um, for the time being it's, uh, it's pretty good for, for this purpose. Yes. Uh, probably also uh, I, I'm, I didn't I didn't make that benchmark and uh, probably the C++ implementation also takes care about the memory that it creates and maybe the the crystal implementation is, is done with the uh, I mean with the standard arrays or, or uh, other structures from the standard library so it's probably because of that So the question is if the union types are uh, can be created by the yeah. programmer? Can I use uh, like union type in annotations? Uh, yes, you can use union type annotations. Uh, for example, when you declare an overload, you can specify a union, or you can create an array of union type uh, by hand. Yes. Can we create new value types? Can we create new value types? Yes, absolutely. Yes, you can use uh, the instead of using class for declaring new types, you use a struct, and that will uh, generate a new value type that lives on the stack. Yes? I, I, I think that your, your idea, idea of separating new from, the, from preference type is, is very, very, very good. Most object-oriented libraries still don't have that. Mm -hmm. it, it has been rather recent, recently added to IFS, so. Mm -hmm. OK. So this was just more like a comment at the yeah, that Eiffel also implements uh, nil as a separate type from uh, reference types. So I don't know if Ruby has operator overloading, but do you hard code class only in integer or? It's a, it's a, plus is a regular method. So I simplified uh, the, the, the slides, but when you had a plus, the same process again happens for the type inference. At the bottom, we have like plus implemented for primitive types uh, with a Yes, just like in Ruby. I was wondering, uh, you said you're not going to use current type uh, of the programming yet, of the processes yet. I was wondering if you have any restrictions on side effects and side response when you use access variables in the sequential resistance. So um, the question was how to, uh, how are we, are we planning to deal with uh, um, uh, shared memory? between fibers, right? So um, 
This will be pretty similar to Go, in which uh, you can share memory, but you should not. You should communicate uh, using channels. You know? so, so the you, can, you have to share uh, by sending and receiving messages and not by uh, sharing memory. So uh, let me re repeat the question. It's a, the question is if we can take advantage of the similarities between Ruby and Crystal so uh, Ruby libraries could be ported to Crystal. Well, it depends. Uh, for simple libraries, maybe it's tr that's true. We actually ported, uh, I mean, the, the compiler itself was uh, once written on, on, on Ruby and we ported to Crystal very easily. Uh, that might not be true for every gem out there, but yeah, I think it, it should uh, make things more easy to, to be ported. Yes? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we, m many members of uh, the uh, the community that we have right now that is is pretty small, but it's growing every day. Uh, most of them are already Ruby programmers, so and they become interested in Crystal because of the, these similarities, just as we are. Okay. Okay. So still we're going to be hanging around. So if you have more questions, and by the way, uh, we have a. Uh, okay, crystal okay. t-shirts like this, maybe not for everyone, everybody, but uh, if you want one of these, you can come by and get one. So thank you. <laughs>